don't call it dirt. Dirt refers to only the abiotic components of soil. Soils are appropriately viewed as an ecosystem that contain the non-living components like sediments, rock, and water, but it also contains all the plant roots, insects, animals, fungi, and bacteria that create a living system. Soils are truly the culmination of all the spheres of Earth. The soils are obviously part of the lithosphere, with the mineral composition being just about half of the total soil profile. But we can see the biosphere in the soil with the plant roots and bacteria and insects that may reside there. There's also water stored within the soil, so there's your hydrosphere component. And all the leftover space is taken up by air, so that atmosphere component is very important, especially when you consider all the nitrogen fixation that occurs in soils. Let's begin with the lithosphere component. The bulk of soils are made from the weathering and erosion of rock. You remember from the geology video that as rock is weathered, it breaks down to these small bits of sediments, which end up being the mineral component of a soil. There's a few ways this can happen. Of course, we've got the physical weathering um, occurring due to wind, rain, or ice that physically breaks apart the rock. Plant roots are powerful, and they will find any crack or weak spot in a rock and burrow through it, which can further break apart the rock, which is a part of biological weathering, but there are also lichens, right? Those symbiotic collection of fungi, algae, and bacteria. These release chemicals that can also break down rock. And finally, rocks can be chemically eroded. The chemical erosion doesn't just make smaller particles, it chemically alters the minerals. Rain that's even slightly acidic can cause a chemical reaction in certain types of rock, like granite that contains a mineral called muscovite, which when exposed to an acid, make clay an important component of soils. So now that we've got our mineral components and a substrate for growth, we can look at the organic component of soils. Collectively, the organic component of soils can be referred to as humus, which is made up of microorganisms, both dead and alive, and dead animals and plants that are in varying stages of decay. I've hinted at this process before in our succession video. Bare rock is weathered into small pieces until there's enough material to allow pioneer species to grow, and as those plants live and die, they incorporate organic material, the humus, into the soil. In this way, I like to think of soil formation as happening both bottom up and top down. Because of this double-sided building of soils, uh, soil profiles develop these very distinct layers that we call horizons. The O horizon, or the organic layer, is largely composed of humus as a result of all the biological activity that's happening at the top of the soil. Just below the O horizon, we have the A horizon, also called the topsoil. The topsoil contains fully decomposed humus material and a mixture of the three minerals that make up soil, sand, silt, and clay. The O and A horizons are important considerations for farmers, as they are the fertile part of soil that supports plant growth. Below the A horizon, we see a lightly colored layer called the E horizon, or the alluviation layer. This layer is formed because, well, rainwater, as it percolates through the top O and A horizon, caused some physical and chemical weathering, which causes many minerals to leach out of the top horizons, and it gets stuck in this layer. Now, not every ecosystem will have an E horizon. That really depends on how much rain an area receives. Collectively, we can refer to the O 
A and E horizon as places where this sort of leaching occurs, where minerals and nutrients are washed down by the water. Below the zone of leaching, you have the B horizon or the subsoil. Now, the subsoil is the zone of accumulation and is where that top-down and bottom-up building of soils really collides. The B horizon has the fully broken down rock material we saw due to weathering, but it's also the horizon where all those leached minerals from the top accumulate. Below that is the C horizon, where we see partially weathered rock. These smaller rocks are called parent material, as they were once, well, weathered to make the mineral portion of the soil. And finally, the R horizon, which is the solid bedrock way underneath. Uh, different ecosystems will have different soil horizons based on the type of plants, the type of bedrock, and the amount of rain the ecosystem receives. A rainforest pictured on the bottom left will have a larger E horizon because of all the rain that consistently leaches nutrients downwards. It will also have a virtually non-existent or very small A horizon as decomposition and the uptake of nutrients happens very quickly in the rainforest. Grasslands will have a deep A horizon because of, well, the seasonality of grasslands, right? Every year, the summer's growth decays as winter comes, creating a deep, nutrient-rich A horizon with lots of nutrient-rich humus. This is, by the way, why so many grasslands were converted into farms. The, the soil there is perfect for growing crops. Deserts will have a very deep B horizon, as the minimal amount of water there doesn't really allow for enough plant growth to create a deep O or a horizon. So the majority of desert soils are just, well, mostly fully weathered rock with little organic material. Earlier I mentioned that the three minerals that make up soils are sand, silt, and clay. The amount of these minerals is what dictates the texture and type of soil you have. Here we have this fancy soil texture diagram that represents the type of soil based on their percent composition of each component. You read this by following diagonal lines on the chart. So let's say you have a soil that is 40% sand, 20% clay, and 40% silt. You follow these lines until you end up at the soil with that composition, which is in this case a loam. Loam is considered the perfect soil for plant growth, as it has this medium balance of all of the minerals. Well, let's see why that's important. Sand, silt, and clay are differently sized particles. Sand is the largest and clay is the smallest. And due to this size, they pack differently with different amount of space between those particles. We call this spacing porosity, or the amount of space between the particles of the soil. Soil with a lot of sand have a lot of pore space, which makes it easy for water and air to infiltrate and percolate through the soil. Soils with a lot of clay have very little pore space, which makes it very difficult for water and air to penetrate down. However, if a soil has too much sand, the water flows too quickly and doesn't allow enough time for plant roots to absorb the water and results in a very quick leaching of nutrients. Clay, despite not letting water through quite as well, has a very important property. It has a high cation exchange capacity. The cation exchange capacity is the soil's ability to hold positively charged ions. Many nutrients that plants need to grow, like magnesium, calcium, potassium, are positively charged ions. See now clay, because of its chemical composition, has a lot of negatively charged particles inside of it. And 
clay particles will attract these nutrients. This is very important as plant roots will absorb these nutrients that are stuck to the clay particles. Without enough clay, those nutrients would leach out too quickly. Silt, I like to think of as the filler. It has a little bit of qualities, both related to sand and clay. Silt is much smaller than sand, so it would slow down the percolation of water and nutrients, but it wouldn't slow it down quite as much as clay. Um, high clay soils are a little too stiff for plants to grow in. So it's really this balance of clay, silt, and sand which makes loam optimal for plant growth. Soils take a long time to form because, well, weathering rock is such a slow process. However, the rate at which soils can be lost occurs much faster than the rate at which soils are formed. Soil erosion is the wearing away of topsoil by water and wind. About half of all the topsoil on the planet has been lost to erosion. Now we can see quickly that this soil erosion can lead to a loss of right, fertile growing land, but it also causes other issues. Flooding can occur more frequently because there is less soil to hold onto the water in the pore space. Soils also actively filter and clean water that moves through them. A lack of this service from soils can degrade water quality in nearby areas. Soil is held in place by plant roots. Anytime plants are removed, the soil becomes very susceptible to erosion. Human activities contribute to this. Deforestation opens up many plots of land to erosion. Now we can prevent that by selectively cutting certain trees, to leave enough intact to hold the soil together. This also occurs when we harvest crops. Farmers can plant cover crops after their harvest to keep the soil from eroding away. Those are only a few examples. We're actually gonna look a little bit more into the issues of soil erosion when we get to our unit on agriculture. This concludes our video on soils. For the rest of the unit, we will look at other Earth systems and how they interact with each other.